What is going on my fellow rock and rollers? Don't forget to hit the bell notification icon to be notified every time I put out a new video on my channel. Few fan clubs are as notorious as the KISS Army, but the idea for the fan club didn't come from the band themselves, or their manager, or even the record label. People can thank two loyal teenage fans from the Midwest. How did this happen? Stay tuned to find out. The story of the KISS Army began with two teenage fans from Indiana. They were named Bill Starkey and Jay Evans, and they lived in the Indiana city of Terre Haute. Starkey came from a family who supported his love of rock and roll, taking him to KISS concerts in 1974, and his father also worked at a warehouse as an expediter for Columbia Records. His father gave Bill his first KISS record, their self-titled debut album from February of 1974. Starkey's father liked KISS, but he would tease his son about what he saw as a band without a future, telling his son, your band isn't doing it. They're playing shows, but the sales are bad. We're not shipping anything, he'd say. He wasn't far off from the truth as the band's first three albums, Kiss, Hotter Than Hell, and Dressed to Kill, didn't dominate the rock charts initially. It didn't matter to Starkey, who still followed his favorite band, and his friend Jay Evans made bootleg copies of Kiss albums, which he shared with people at school. And Starkey and Evans even worked at a place called Wayne's World Fashion, where they would decide Starkey would become the commander-in-chief of the KISS army, while Evans would take the title of Field Marshal. And you may be wondering, why did they call it the KISS army and not just the KISS fan club? According to Evans, he would say it sounded too wimpy. Prior to the band getting any airplay on radio, Starkey and Evans would be teased mercilessly by their schoolmates over being KISS fans. Evans would remember, we all showed up at school in our KISS t-shirts and got taunted. Still, it didn't really dampen our enthusiasm. Usually in high school, anything you get taunted for, you want to shy away from, but we just didn't. According to Starkey, the kids at school would say to them, Kiss? Kiss my ass. Starkey, if they're so good, why aren't they on the radio? And Starkey, for his part, couldn't come up with a good response, and he wondered, yeah, why aren't they on the radio? In January of 1975, Starkey and Evans wanted to get their favorite band Kiss played on the local radio, so they started calling the radio station WVTS. But the program director, Rich Dickerson, ignored the request, referring to KISS as, and I quote, a mediocre Bachman-Turner overdrive. Rather than give up, they called back into the radio station claiming to be the KISS army. They would continue to badger the station, going as far as sending in letters threatening to blow up the radio station unless it complied with their request. And their perseverance seemed to pay off, as by the summer of 1975, the local radio station started to play KISS's music, often referring to the KISS Army live on the air. Also helping things was that KISS's Alive album was released around this time, and the band was scheduled to play the city that fall. And it wasn't long before the radio station was inundated with calls from people asking how they could enlist in the KISS Army. And when WVTS decided to play KISS on their station, they had to reach out to Starkey to bring in his recordings from the band, as the station had previously thrown out their singles for Rock and Roll All Night and Strutter. Soon enough, the program director who initially ignored the teens would team up to promote an upcoming KISS concert in Terre Haute, and soon enough KISS's publicist would reach out to Starkey and Evans to discuss the KISS Army, which wasn't an official fan club just yet. The teens found themselves going live on WVTS to recruit as many members as possible ahead of their scheduled show, and KISS would perform in Terre Haute on November 21st, 1975, and to recognize the efforts of Starkey, he met the band at the airport, was brought on stage that night, and given an honorary plaque, as well as ate dinner with the band at a Chinese restaurant following the show, and had breakfast with them the following morning. Starkey initially thought that he would continue to run the KISS army from his home in Indiana, and in November of 1975, KISS's management company got in touch with him and said the group was looking forward to the band having their fan club headquartered in Indiana. The following year, his dream would be dashed as Starkey received a letter from Boutwell Enterprises from Woodland Hills, California, informing him that they would be running the KISS army. And KISS's manager, Bill LaCoyne, would procure Howard Marks Incorporated to create the logo of the fan club. And the band's 1976 album, Destroyer, featured order forms to sign up for the KISS Army. Ron Boutwell, who was the head of merchandising at the time for KISS, claimed that at its peak, the KISS Army was bringing in $5,000 per day and had almost 100,000 members. But by the 80s, the KISS Army seemed to have fallen off the band's radar, and for Starkey's part, he was never compensated financially for his work, but he would get complimentary tickets to the band's shows. 
In August of 2007, the band announced the reactivation of the KISS Army. One of the band's higher profile members was former U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, who enlisted in the Army in May of 2008. In celebration of the KISS Army's 35th anniversary, November 21, 2010, was declared KISS Army Day in Terre Haute, and Starkey served as the guest DJ for the local rock radio station WWVR that day. So you guys are maybe wondering, what is Starkey up to these days? Well, he would end up going to college and becoming a teacher, and he currently teaches at an inner city school. So that does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. If you guys have suggestions for future topics, let me know in the comment section below. Take care.